Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Marlene Orozco and I'm part of the Building Momentum Host Committee. And I also serve as research analyst with the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative at the GSB. I hope you've enjoyed your previous session. We're excited to keep the momentum going. We have an excellent conversation up next on scaling sales and operations. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's uh, as a Cal grad, it's always exciting to, to talk at Stanford. Um, go Bears. And uh, I'm uh, the CEO, founder of Rocket Lawyer. Uh, we're an online legal service uh, for everybody. So uh, about one in nine American adults has a Rocket Lawyer account. We have about 25 million registered users and we, uh, we help people to uh, do everything legal in a natively digital platform, which we've seen in the pandemic has really been an accelerating need when we couldn't have physical presence. Um, we actually had news today. We announced, uh, I'm very uh, thankful the team worked really hard and we announced a $223 million investment in Rocket Lawyer by Vista Capital, um, which, uh, which uh, I'm happy to talk about and certainly um, I think demonstrates that legal tech companies can, um, can, uh, can scale. Great, thank you. We'll pass it over to uh, Cecilia. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Cecilia Corral. I'm the co-founder and VP of product at Care Message. We're a patient engagement platform for underserved patient populations. We reach over 8 million patients across the United States and uh, two U.S. territories uh, and really helping uh, healthcare providers connect with patients around things tied to appointment reminders, gaps in care, uh, healthcare screenings and, and healthcare coaching. Uh, excited to be here and, and share more around uh, our work. And especially uh, the last year has been very busy with COVID. Um, so it's been an exciting time of uh, a lot of growth and, and scale for our organization. Um, so looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Cecilia. And last but certainly not least, Tom Chavez, go ahead and, and uh, give, us a, give us a brief introduction. Sure. Uh, Tom Chavez, I uh, co-founded and helped run a startup studio in San Francisco called Superset. What that means is that we, we found, fund, and form uh, companies from scratch. I also, alongside those responsibilities, we, we think of ourselves as player coaches. So I, I run a privacy security company called Catch. Uh, I'm, I guess what they call, you know, technical uh, serial tech entrepreneur. I've built a couple companies in the past, and now I'm really enjoying the build out over here at Superset and Catch. Uh, unlike Cecilia and Charlie, I'm, I'm, we're a little bit earlier in our journey here with, with Superset and Catch, but we just announced our Series A for Catch uh, in Q4. Uh, just excited to be part of the conversation today. Great, thank you. And we're excited to have you. Now you all span a variety of industries from legal to healthcare, and certainly uh, across the intersections of, of tech. And you all have had your experience in uh, either growing your current company or growing previous companies. And so we'd like to kick off today's conversation on scaling sales and operations on the role that you all play as CEO or as COO and how that role changes as your company grows. Um, so we'll start with whoever would like to jump in first. Well, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I've built a couple of companies, as I mentioned, and the last one got to some meaningful kind of scale. And now I'm at the very beginning of the journey with several of the companies we're building at Superset. And I've told friends and employees, companies for me are sort of like children. If you have kids, um, the kids do certain things at certain stages that the psychologists term developmentally appropriate. And I had teams Okay, they're doing interesting things now, but that's very, that's really developmentally appropriate, right? And I think companies are much the same way. You're a baby, you're a toddler, you're an adolescent, and you have to do certain things at those different stages. Um, it's also tricky as you grow to remember, or at least I, I can vividly remember the times and places earlier on where I was trying to do the same thing that really worked at that earlier stage. And I had to learn that what got me there wasn't going to get me where I was headed. So I, I try to enroll my teams in understanding that, okay, we're gonna, for example, the company I run right now, we don't have org charts, 
We don't have titles. We don't have reporting lines. It's just 17 banditos going off and building something from scratch. And, and I like to tell people, listen, we're gonna, it's good. We're gonna do, let there be chaos. Andy Grove used to say, let chaos reign and then you reign in chaos, right? As we get to those new stages, we'll have, we'll have more structured reporting lines. We'll have more structured accountabilities. We have OKRs today, but they're very loose because they need to be. And it's because it's relevant to the stage we're at. So uh, I think the main thing is just to be open-eyed about what stage are you at? What kinds of habits and practices do you need to, to really drive forward for that stage and then be prepared to revise as you go. Great, thank you for, for those insights. And um, what about you, Charlie? Do you have no organizational chart? <laughs> no, we definitely have an org chart. Um, uh, I uh, uh, do believe in structure. Uh, part of my own background and mentoring is uh, I was a Navy officer um, actually grew up working in a family business, you know, small business, a lot, a lot like our customers. Um, you know, I grew up uh, working at my dad's gas station and, uh, and you know, uh, in a family business, I was, I was managing a gas station uh, when I was 13. And um, so, uh, you know, it, it's sort of been part of my life uh, the whole time. Um, but I do believe in structure um, and I'll talk about that for a, a second. Uh, and I and I and I and more than anything, uh, I, I believe in talent and a performance culture, uh, and and what that can really do. So, you know, um, we actually had an all hands meeting today, and um, I was uh, we have about 250 employees, and um, it, when we're doing that, and I'm starting to see you know hundreds of folks together at one time, uh, it's astonishing because the company started with just myself and, and another person who still works there, Rob. And when we would get every, uh, every order initially, you know, my phone would ping and it would tell me, oh, you know, somebody, somebody signed up for a Rocket Lawyer account. Well, that obviously doesn't scale. Um, it's really about 25,000 or so subscribers that I realized uh, we really needed sort, sort of more structure and we needed to bring in more talent that had scaled uh, organizations uh, before um, because uh, the biggest company that I've ever worked for is uh, whatever size Rocket Lawyer is on any given day. And so um, as an example, we just hired a VP of operations who, uh, who has had 8,000 people reporting to him um, at AT&T at, at in a prior role and uh, from PayPal. So I just think um, uh, lastly to bundle it up, We've reorganized the company multiple times. Um, uh, I just talked about this to, at our all hands meeting this morning. Um, when, when we think about, you know, what did we do to sort of this latest milestone where we took the business um, over the last three or four years to this financing I mentioned, we closed today, um, which is a lot of value creation. And the key was actually for us process and a reorg that we did about three years ago, where we reorganized our all our roles to be as customer facing as we could possibly make them. So we went away from having like marketing and sales and these things. Instead, we have you know customer acquisition and we have you know lifetime value, which is all about customer engagement and somebody who's an executive uh, or leader who owns each of those functions. So um, I'd say. Uh, the structure of our organization, I can't speak for anyone else, absolutely changes and sometimes radically changes. Uh, uh, you know, I'd say every two or three years, um, it, it'll radically change and aligning the structure with the strategy is super important. Great, thank you for those insights, uh, Charlie. And, and, and certainly there is no single path, right? Whether it's structured or no organizational chart, you know, we're, we're trying to share uh, the variety of pathways that one can take and certainly scaling. Um, so Cecilia at Care Message, tell us a little bit about how your role may have uh, changed over time. Yeah, for me being on the product and engineering side, most of where I spent my time in the early days was 
playing the product manager role within the team, being on the ground, doing user research, creating mock-ups. I think I've done all sorts of things across the organization all the way through supporting our customers and, and, and playing a sales role at some point as well. Um, so I think the early days are, are definitely more around, um, you know, being on the ground, rolling up your sleeves, doing, um, doing all the things that need to get done. And I think the way that uh, I think my role has changed the most as the organization has grown is uh, moving away from the doing to the showing, the coaching, and the motivating. Um, because I think the only way that organizations uh, can really grow and do so successfully is when, you know, especially you as a founder, hire people that are better than you at certain things, and you start to hand things off and delegate and um, you know, be available to step in whenever that's necessary. But for the most part, um, scaling up the the infrastructure in terms of the people and the skill set on the team is, is it's what's really you know most important and can be really uncomfortable. Um, I miss playing the man the product manager role. I miss like doing some of those things and, and being on the ground uh, when it was five people around a table. Um, you know, building features and hearing from customers every day it was it was really exciting. But for what the company needs from me at this point is, is really the way I, I say the the role really changes and and the best way that you change with that as a founder is um, staying in tune with what the company needs from you. And I think over time, um, a lot of what people look for more from you is is the motivation, the vision, the the strategy, being the gut check of how do we stay focused. Um, we're around 50 people now, so not, not huge, but we've also been just really mindful about uh, scaling our impact and, and getting to a, a level of sustainability while keeping the headcount low, um, which is a, something else that we've been uh, really intentional about and you know, happy to, to share more in, uh, as we head into other, other questions as well. Yeah, that's great. I was actually just uh, in a session on um, building teams, which oftentimes happens, you know, in conjunction with building sales and operations. And I know, Charlie, you mentioned just hiring a new VP of operations. Tell us a little bit more about how you think about scaling uh, your operations and your people efficiently. Absolutely. Um, and it's a, and so I really love what Cecilia just said about um, the CEO's role changing. Um, uh, I, you know, if, if I feel like if I'm doing my job well, I'm, I'm able to, um, work with the team to get vision alignment and then it, 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 on any plan and that vision doesn't change, you know, the North star, we talk about what our North star is and, and that North star doesn't change, you know, the North star is fixed. It's the same point in the sky that enslaved people used uh, to, to go north 200 years ago uh, is the same North Star today. And so the North Star that we set for ourselves at, uh, now this isn't true for everybody, but that we set for ourselves, which is just make justice affordable for people is the same. It's the same. And, 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 and I was telling the team today, I'm really proud of not cornering that vision off and staying aligned to it. And then what do we have to do to accomplish it? So um, my role changes over time, or the C any founder CEO's role changes as you go from being a player to being a player coach to just being a coach, right? And Cecilia, I think, summed that up beautifully. So today, um, look, in at the beginning, you know, I was in live person myself. It was on my desk, and I could see, you know, customer service chat, and I might jump in and be chatting with customers. Um, um, fast forward to now. And uh, yes, we've got a, a, a VP of operations that we just hired who's come in and looked at an operation that I thought was going along swimmingly because customers like the service and it turns out it's nowhere near world-class. Um, and he's now fixing a lot of things and doing a lot of you know, process improvement that I don't know how to do. And nobody else on the team knows how to do for the, I think we have about 40 customer service reps right now. And so, um, and, and he's got to take that to three times that size. So I don't know how to do that. But what I hope I know how to do is to get, still sticking with the VP of operations, to get him uh, motivated about the vision, the mission, the strategy, three different things, to get him really motivated about those things. And then 
to help him to stay on track as he goes into the details that are we doing things that are uh, still heading toward that North Star or not. One example, if we're making things cost more, that's not, our, that's not our North Star. That's not our brand. Our brand is to make things cost less, to make attorney services less expensive, not more. And, um, and, and so that's just one example. Tom, would you like to jump in and share some insights from your experience as a serial entrepreneur on this topic? It really, really resonates um, how Cecilia and Charlie are talking about this. Because, you know, being an entrepreneur is a strange job. I, I have had moments where I try to explain. I remember my kids when they were younger, they asked me, Dad, what do you do? I said, I think that was a little bit different. I remember feeling like I didn't what the, what the heck did I do again? And it's not very well studied, right? Bucker, in the past, had observed that you know, in business school, you study operations and finance and accounting and, and all kinds of things. Nobody really studies what, what an entrepreneur, or CEO, or founder does. So I guess you know, in my little frame of reference, and, and what Charlie said really resonated, where early on, I'm trained as an engineer. Right. So when you come to company building with that institution, you know, you, you did some math, you're wrong or you're right. You wrote some code, it works or it doesn't. And, and so I remember vividly like having my finger in every eye and feeling like I needed to, to make sure everything was working. Um, I was also like close to a cardiac event. I remember you know, when I was running that first company trying to do that and I realized sort of to Charlie's point, it's about getting results through people. Right? The job is about, I think it's about having the strategy, the vision, and not just the, a, you know, a, a lavish, outlandish thing, but a practical vision of what you're going to do. I think you have to enroll and persuade and communicate to all of the relevant people, your employees, your investors, how you're going to do it. Right? I think you can have the vision, the plan, the blueprint, but if you can't persuade people to jump on board, then not going to necessarily get very far. I think you need to oversee the implementation. And I also have found CEOs lots of times. I had a, it was an associate of mine. I remember once he wanted to just like dwell in the clouds and have the vision and didn't want to get his hands dirty with any of the practical implementation details. And so I think there's this sort of to oversee it, you really have to be willing to get dirt under your fingernails. You have to snake in and out of the places where you can ask a useful question and verify that the thing that needed to get done is actually getting done. Um, with a lot of attention finally to just measuring how you're doing. But I think um, when I was a pop running my first company, I would get so engrossed with an idea and then I didn't, and I remember investors would jam me up as they should like, wait a minute, so we said we're gonna be here and we're not there yet. And I, you know, I, I had to learn the importance of actually measuring and, and you know, setting achievable milestones, hitting those milestones and, and just measuring our progress collectively along the way. So it's a weird, weird job, Marlene, but, and, and I don't know if anybody, you know, you, I feel like I'm still figuring it out every day, but hopefully it's a little clearer now than it was before. Cecilia, did you want to jump in and, and talk a little bit about how you've thought about uh, at Care Message um, scaling operations and people? Yeah, I, I'll give a, a slightly different take uh, from what's been been shared for one other uh, area of this that I think is really tied to uh, my background. I Building an organization, I think one of the realizations I had early on was you know, this is an opportunity to do things different, slightly different than um, than other companies have. And I think as somebody who, uh, you know, I studied engineering, I had applied at a lot of big tech companies, I got a lot of no's. And so um, this, you know, area of uh, lack of diversity um, at other organizations, I just kind of very early on kind of asked myself this question of like, okay, well, how do we do it different so that we don't become, you know, what all these other companies have become? And how do we 
uh, lay a foundation in the beginning so that as we grow our team, we're mindful about having gender diversity, racial diversity, all types of things that, um, that to me were important. And so um, something that uh, to me became really important that I think is important when you're starting with, you know, not just the founding team, but your first employees is like being mindful of that because um, that is going to set the pace for what the company will continue to look like. Um, and so if you're, if you have a very homogenous group as like your first employees, it's very likely that as you continue to grow and hire and like the company is going to continue to look like that. Um, so we were very intentional from the beginning uh, about uh, having, you know, a diverse pipeline of candidates as we were hiring, uh, you know, having a diverse team in general and just continuing to nurture that and putting things in place that um, enabled us to, to continue to, to scale that as we were growing as uh, I stopped interviewing every single person and other people started to interview, just ensuring we, we had um, structured interviews, ensuring we had um, other, you know, kind of rubrics of evaluating um, not only candidates, but our employees as well, standard, you know, uh, career ladders and things of that sort, so that we were also uh, promoting equitably. Um, so those have just been some of the other things that, and strategies that we've tried um, as we continue to grow to just uh, continue to nurture that kind of environment and maybe do things as a company a little bit different than um, the examples that we had uh, and it, most of the examples that I think we were seeing out in the world. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to jump in on one other one other point here. Um, uh, culture and values uh, uh, is something we spent a lot of time on and I'd say about uh, really about five years ago. So the company is a little over 10 years old. About five years ago, we, we really looked at it. And what we what we try to do is figure out um, the folks who are just thriving in at Rocket Lawyer, um, how are they doing it? And, uh, and, and, and it's almost like a metaphorical blood test we wanted to do and say like, wh why are they so happy, successful? Um, what's what's inside there? And, um, and we did this whole, you know, series of exercises together over uh, several months. And we came up with kind of 10 things. Um, other companies do this called Rocket Lawyer DNA. Um, I think what may be unique is that when we identified these attributes, um, we, then in court, we then put it into everything as far as how we evaluate candidates. Because um, it's good for the candidate, it's good for us if they know, if, if we sort of screen them against, it's almost like, again, a metaphorical blood test. And it's like screen them against this, um, and um, you know I'm really proud of how diverse we are. We're almost 50% women. Um, you know, obviously have a black founder. Um, our our board is uh, has uh, you know four people of color out of seven on the board. Um, so unusual uh, for for a tech company, um, but it's not actually by trying at the diversity part. It's actually has happened. And, um, you know, again, at this all hands meeting, what I'm going to remember is an important one for the company today. But again, it was just sort of looking around and going, wow. And I think part of that is this DNA thing is, is we have people who care about that <laughs> and, and they care about it. And we know they care about it. They've demonstrated that they care about it in other places. And then as a result, organizationally, we don't have really to like be so focused on that because, because it's a core value and we're hiring people who also share that core value up front. And then, the, the, and then lastly, we, we then incorporated these, this uh, sort of these DNA factors um, into our training and onboarding, and we refer back to them constantly. You'll hear it in meetings uh, when people are talking about getting a particular thing done and something that Tom was talking about, it's one of our principles, we're all doers. Um, we're all doers, we don't ever use the term individual contributor in the company, no, uh, we don't have any managers, we have leaders because leader is a rankless thing. And so while we have organizational structure, everybody can be a leader, everybody has to be a doer, um, et cetera. These are just, I, could, I, could, I can do two hours on this because I do, Every, which is the last part I do, you know, had to commit my own time again, as we're talking to founder CEOs, had to commit and it and it's actually hard, you know, as we've grown, but I made a commitment that, that every hiring class and you know, again, as you grow, we're going to hire about 200 people this year. 
So there's every week there's new people we brought on board. So I, I, there's not a week it doesn't happen. And, and I, I promise it wouldn't let a week go by of people joining the company without spending an hour, 90 minutes with them to walk through uh, culture, you know, North Star, mission, strategy, culture, how we work. And so I, I do it uh, pretty much every week for 90 minutes. And there's actually two sessions. And so I end up spending a lot of my time <laughs> every week uh, now on either, uh, you know, interviewing people or training people. And, uh, and then you've got to have an organization, or at least we do, because it's how we do it, where other people can do a lot of things that I used to do <laughs> because I'm spending my time <laughs> interviewing people and training people <laughs> a lot uh, with a lot of the time. Yeah, I mean, vigorous plus one on that, Charlie. I, uh, I'm right there with you. I, you know, the first company I built was a company called Wrapped. Their process called Wrapped. The company was called Crux. We called it Crux. And I just found like it was so important. Look at what the new employees we would have three to three hour session. We would do it in batches. And, and it sounded a little cultish, like Crux. What's that all about? And then I would say, hey, we're not going to talk about products, customers, revenue. You know, what we're going to talk about is like broad, sprawling vision for the company. We're just going to talk about our values. The way that collaboration. What do we mean exactly by collaboration? And we can stretch out and have these conversations literally for like hours with, with new employees. And I, we always felt like, yeah, I, mean, I don't want to sound too breezy about it, but like, you can, there's always a technical thing you can solve it. There's always a customer problem. It's how we do what we do, right? And for the long haul, that really defines the success of the company, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Culture, you have to be productive. Every day, I, I really believe that. Mm, terrific. I'm getting some great ideas here uh, of what I, how I can do some of these things better, too. <laughs> Ditto. I mean, I remember, so when I was at the beginning, I remember feeling just kind of squeamish about it. I, these are so soft, right? These topics. And and I remember, and I still see people get really uncomfortable, right? When we're, when we're talking, we also have these little habits. We would, when we were all not on screens, now we do Amazon gift cards, but we used to hand out crispy $100 bills. So we would, and we would give them to somebody publicly at all hands, not because, you know, $100 was going to change anyone's life, but it was just to, to amplify, you know, community. We, really, we talk about grit, and here are three examples of the way kids live. Our, our value of grit the last couple of months, and then everybody sees it. You start to reinforce the vibe and the culture and the values, right? Also, the other really cool thing about it is that the people who aren't part of that and don't subscribe kind of self select out. Right. Like, like they just sort of like, yeah, these guys, these are not my people. Good. I mean, this isn't good for you, right? If you're not going to like truly subscribe to these values, then maybe. Yeah, the first thing, and maybe Marlene, but the first thing that I say in these sessions with new hires is, um, you know, good good news for you. Uh, I'm not talk, going to be talking today about what we're going to try to turn you into. <laughs> I'm going to be talking to you about what we think you already are, because that's why we hired you, <laughs> and and uh, and and then that's what what the conversation is about, because that's actually what the process is about. Yeah, that's great. I'd love to follow up on this, where the discussion is going in terms of really scaling with equity and impact in mind. And, you know, we've had, we started to talk about the North Star and, and knowing your kind of your values. And, and, and Charlie, you talked about, you know, not trying on the diversity right part because it's already part of the DNA. Um, I, I would love for you all to share in, in your, from your experiences um, kind of how you've stuck to that and perhaps situations where um, your values may be compromised or challenged and how then do you continue to scale uh, with, with equity and impact and, and really thinking about double bottom line models here to, to follow. And we'll start, uh, Cecilia, if you can uh, kick us off here. 
Yeah, I um, I think the way that we've uh, approached it in terms of putting things in place, so I mentioned like structured interviews, right? And then you kind of let the process follow, you know, just, just give you the results, um, right? Uh, it's For us, something like that was about uh, providing a level playing field for all, you know, candidates, right? And so once you have something like that in place, you are going to end up with a diverse team because you're giving everyone an equal playing field, right? We're not hiring because I want to go grab a beer with this person. Like you're hiring for a specific set of skill sets that you've defined. And when, when you do that, you will hire the best people. And, and oftentimes what you end up with is the diverse team because that's the nature of this, how skills and talent is distributed in the world. Um, and so there's definitely been situations where things like that have been challenged, where there have been people that come in and, you know, because maybe at their previous company, they did hire off of the person that they grabbed a beer with. And that was a part of their evaluation process. Uh, there have been times where people want to change our, our, our process and in certain areas that we feel strongly about um, in those ways. But a lot of it, I think for me, uh, has come back down to the education piece and, and sort of providing some uh, background information or, or explaining the why. I feel like that's what I spend most of my time doing uh, for all things across the organization is just uh, going back to explaining the why, explaining what problem did we originally set out to solve with this process we put in place or this thing that we have. and. Um, and taking that time to explain that to people and, and kind of where the company is coming from in terms of, of having um, and what we're trying to aim to have, right, as an equitable um, environment, um, whether that's on the pay front, so we don't actually allow uh, people to negotiate uh, when we give an offer um, in a big part because we know that women, people of color are less likely to be negotiating and we want to um, reduce the, the chance that we'll end up with wage disparities for people that are doing the same role at the same level. Um, but, you know, a, a, again, a lot of it for us and for me personally has come down to explaining the why and, and sticking to that um, and really, you know, holding yourself accountable because it is easy sometimes to maybe, I don't know, feel like, oh, there's this really great candidate, but they're asking for more money. But then I have to ask myself, how is this fair to the person that's already on the team that's performing that role? I can't bring somebody new onto the team to get paid more than that person that's already you know, been here for two years. Um, so th those challenges come up, but I, I think it's in those opportunities that um, if you, uh, as, as Charlie has called it, if you have that North Star and you know like where you're heading, um, you have to remind yourself constantly of that and you have to remind um, others on the team about it as well. Yeah, I love the, your your reference to you know starting with why and maybe why it's an act is an inspiration for you like like for for me. I actually show why it's an act. Start with why, famous TED talk um, to is part of the training. So it seems like we have a lot in common. Um, I think starting with why is really important um, and referring back to it. And um, um, you know, um, I, I've thought for a long time. Um, you know, since I was a little kid, actually, that, um, you know, the best way to uh, change things, this is going to, this is a tautology, but the best way to change things is to change things, right? And so, um, you know, um, I'm, I'm proud of having changed some things already um, in, in that, you know, we, we have been able to, to scale a business, we have been able to you know, access capital, um, done it a couple times at another startup that, um, that uh, got some scale and was well funded before Rocket Lawyer. And um, so, so, you know, it can be done um, for sure. And, and, and I'm obviously living proof of that. Um, so beyond that, now, uh, back to what we were talking about before. So uh, as far as, you know, diversity, inclusion, this double bottom line people talk about. Um, uh, w one of the team members we hired uh, two years ago is a really strong head of people operations. And it's, it's her 
she owns it. That's another one of the principles. And you hear people at Rockford say own it, right? So, so I know in the company who owns it, who owns that. And it's important enough for somebody to own it. And it's important enough to build a whole team around it. Um, now the how we do it is probably a little different because um, again, we, we want to, um, it's like having those principles on the wall. We want, we know we succeeded when they don't need to be on the wall anymore because they're inside. And so where we want to get to is that these shared values, they're all inside. And so the byproduct of it that you get is, wow, you look around and you go, um, uh, like we did today and why this is fresh in mind, we do shout outs at, at our all hands meetings. And uh, it just was accidental. It just happened that um, I think like seven or if I was just going to count now, I think it's probably like seven out of 10 of the shout outs, something like that were women. And there were engineers and just across the board and uh somebody noticed it and it was like wow and it reminded me of something ruth bader ginsburg said she was asked and maybe you guys have seen this it's a famous moment of hers but she was asked um how many women do you want to see on the supreme court and she said how about nine <laughs> there have been nine or nine white men on the supreme court for 190 years and nobody that didn't bother anybody and uh and so it's just, you know, if it, if, if, if it turns out that, you know, at some point, you know, everybody's black in some department or everybody's white or everybody's female or everybody's uh, of, of a different, uh, you know, of, uh, non-binary, you know, whatever uh, the, the person's, wh whatever's inside the person and outside the person, uh, that's when we know we've gotten there. That's when we know we're there. Uh, when it when it's not intentional and um, uh, we're not there yet and I don't think just about anybody is but that's again that's that's as far as we're concerned that that's where we're where we want to get to yeah I mean I we're not there yet there's a lot of work to be done but that's that's the beautiful vision and I think that's, where, that's what makes working so hard to achieve it so worthwhile right I mean we're we're um so in our company and what we do, I, I, when we're thinking about diversity and equity in our company, we remember that many of the seeds, like we're swimming against 25 to 30 years as long as, as, long as I sort of think a lot of the things that could have happened 25 years ago didn't happen. And now we're swimming against that tide and kind of trying to get it right, we're trying to get more uh, women, more positions to get underrepresented. Our Tom, I apologize. I'm going to interject. Um, hope I look a little frozen there. I don't know if I'm the only one having trouble hearing you, um, but if you could come closer to your mic. The other reason I'm interjecting is we only have about four minutes left in this session, and I'm the person in charge of Q&A. And we do have a question, and I think we have time to answer this one. So let me put it out there, and Tom, maybe you can be the first person to take it. And that is Nina, one of our audience members, would like to know a little bit more about equity. In particular, um, how she should think about uh, giving away equity to early stage employees. And then Cecilia, I think you kind of touched on her second question a bit, and that's how do you handle employees who request more equity? So Tom, as our serial entrepreneur, can you start there? Okay, my mic is working better now. So I'll try to crowd in a little bit. Uh, look, I mean, I like working in a market where there are, and speaking of equity, not just in terms of options, but equity when it comes to equity, these things have to be fairly proportioned to delegated. And I think that there are lots of good metrics, at least in our business, that we all subscribe to. We have comp um, studies and surveys that tell us what different employees in different backgrounds or, or in different roles should expect to make, depending on the stage. So there's no one simple kind of algorithmic answer to this. It's a matrix, right? That's stage dependent. And, and for us, the most important thing is to is to make sure that we're we're doing it in a fair consistent way i also like to point out a lot of people markets are efficient companies are efficient employees they get they go out and they have drinks and they all start to have that conversation what did you get so being fair and consistent about it and explaining your reasons 
transparently. Actually, when we hire new senior executives, I just give them the VC comp survey so they can see for themselves. Making it as transparent as possible, I think, is, is a key part of the, of the overall approach. Charlie, Cecilia, one of you want to make a few comments? Go ahead, Cecilia. Yeah, I was actually going to answer exactly what Tom mentioned. Uh, we use a lot of market data, um, you know, not just on for for all the kind of level setting for a more like comprehensive um, compensation uh, package and uh, care messages. Actually, on the kind of more on the equity side, we are structured as a nonprofit, so we're a little different because we don't have uh, equity in the traditional kind of share type of sense. Um, but at least on the compensation front and accounting for other uh, things that we that we offer to our uh, employees, it's all based on market data to, to try and ensure that we're worth level set with the market. Yeah, we actually have a lot of process around this and, and have for a while. Um, I, I think some of that may be the history of, you know, the fact that I, I was a securities lawyer before this and, you know, wrote a lot of option plans back uh, back, back in my original um, incarnation. Um, but we have a lot of process around it and uh, back to the sort of core values. Um, we, we want people to be able to, to trust. So the benchmarking is a part of the process for sure. Um, and, and then there's also this uh, periodic reviews. Um, we, we, we look at equity and uh, uh, cash compensation uh, at least every six months. And everybody knows when they're going to be up and when it's going to be looked at. And, and, and the values part of it is, is that uh, we, we have a culture where if you have to ask, uh, well, you shouldn't have to ask at all. It, you, should, you should just, the process should work. You should get more and more and more and more. Um, and if you're not, and you have to ask, that's, that's a signal, that's a signal. And um, so we have to keep that promise, right? We have to, so um, we're, we're, we're looking, um, um, we're actually in the middle of one of those six month reviews right now. And, and a lot of back to, again, talking as a founder CEO, you know, when it gets to me, a lot of it is just sort of critical thinking and kind of looking through here and trying to find ways to find where we didn't keep our promise and somebody delivered and delivered and delivered and isn't getting rewarded for it. And that's really what, what I spend most of my time in those, uh, in that part of the process doing. And Charlie, thank you. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut you off there. Um, thank you all three of you for the very thoughtful answers. As we've come to the close, Marlene, let me pass this back to you and you can close us out. Thank you.